Good morning. Good morning. 
But may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. We gather around the table today and we do so in remembrance of the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part, but the whole, was nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Would you sing with me? You can stand.
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You be seated. Thank you for joining us this morning. It's a blessing to see all of you here today. And those who are not members of First Baptist Church, you are our honored guests. And we only ask one thing of you this morning, and that's that if you'll take the card that's in front of you that says information card. And if you'll fill that out, give us some information about yourself. And uh, this will be a record of your attendance today. Again, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Those who've gathered by way of Facebook, we welcome you as well. Thank you for joining us. We're gonna spend just a few moments greeting one another. And as the music begins, uh, you'll stand. And if you'll turn around and wave or say hello to those who've joined us by Facebook and then greet each other. So would you stand please and let's greet. <laughs> I think it's my turn. <laughs> well, good morning. We're doing the Lord's Supper this morning, so I forget we have a different schedule going on. If y'all would, take your Bibles, turn them to Genesis chapter 3. We're going to be reading out of verses 12 through 21 this morning. Go ahead and stand as you turn there. Genesis chapter 3, verses 12 through 21. Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 12, says, The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock. And above all beasts of the field, on your belly you shall go, in dust you shall eat, all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, 
you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat of the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread to return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Church, will you please pray with me? Lord Jesus, we praise you this morning because you are good. We look around and we watch the news and we see the events that are happening in our world. And Lord Jesus, it's so easy to get distracted. Lord, this morning I pray that you focus our minds on you. Would you quiet our hearts and help us to listen to this word as Brother Donnie comes up in a few short minutes to preach this text. Thank you so much that the curse of sin was removed by your sacrifice, that we can find life in you. Jesus, it's in your name that we pray. Amen.
Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you today. Glad you could be here. I missed being here last Sunday, but I appreciate Jim and Jerry filling in for me while I was gone. We have a new grandson. He is a tiny little fellow, and I have a really cool picture of him holding my finger. And so come by, and I'll show it to you later on. I have a short public service announcement related to the Lord's Supper that we'll be doing in just a little while. We've done it this way several times, and so most of you, I think, have become accustomed to it. You know how we do it. I'll be preaching, and the sermon will lead right into the supper that we'll share together. At the right time, I will ask you to just leave your seats and come in somewhat orderly fashion and to the front and help yourself to the, the little cup there. We invite all those who have come to know Jesus as their personal Savior, have submitted your life in obedience to Him to share with us in the Lord's Supper after a little while. The public service announcement, not only that part of the explanation, but this guy's a little tricky. It's an all-in-one deal. It's got the juice on the top and the, the little bread on the bottom. You just kind of peel it off on both ends. And try not to let the bread fall on the floor, but nevertheless... I think you'll figure it out when the time comes, and I'll guide you through how we eat that and drink that at the end of the service. So we are dealing with these opening chapters of Genesis and what I have described to you as foundational doctrines. I wrote a bit of a blog post and put it on our website that covers, I think, the first five of those, and there are more that I will be adding to that. The list is just getting too long for me to try to repeat that list every Sunday of these very important and basic pieces that we are learning as we work through the book of, or the early chapters of Genesis. We're not going to do the whole book. It'd take us a few years, I suppose, but these early chapters, we have come to the aftermath of the fall. Someone has wisely said that it's not the fall that kills you, it's the sudden stop at the end. And I suppose if you're jumping out of an airplane, that's kind of true. That is somewhat true in the spiritual realm, but it's much bigger than that. Not only was the sudden stop that we're getting to today painful, but the whole fall process that we tried to look at a couple of weeks ago. And today we're seeing what you might could describe as the consequences of the fall. What happens after the fall? Of course, the fall is somewhat of a technical word that we use in Christian circles to describe that whole event of Adam and Eve sinning, rebelling against God, and their fall into sin, and of course, the aftermath. So, the consequences. When I was a child, I, uh, I guess one of the sharpest memories I have of childhood is the fact that there were consequences to disobedience. Uh, perhaps you have similar kinds of memories of having done something in disobedience to your parents or at school or whatever, and then you lived into the consequences. The consequences were not just the punishment that if I got caught, there was just almost always a punishment. Sometimes it was corporal, but not nearly so much as what I make it sound. There were only a few of those. More often, it was a restriction of some kind or maybe a very long talking to. You had the same things, and you did the same things with your children. There were infractions, and there were consequences that you had to, to pay as a result of that. What I really didn't understand too clearly as a child, and it's hard for kids to catch this, is that consequences are much bigger than just the punishment that followed the infraction. Consequences are felt by the child, and they can be felt over some time. For example, I still remember those times. I don't remember every time I got corrected or restricted or what have you, but I remember even after all these years, what happened after disobedience. It stuck with this consequence. These 60 some odd years later, they're still impactful on my life. I didn't know, though, how the consequences were felt by other people, not just me. 
Sometimes, because I disobeyed, my friends got caught up in the disobedience and they had consequences to pay as well. There were other times whenever it was broader even than the friends. There were on occasion when I did something in class and the teacher had said, one more person pipe up and the whole class is going to have to come after school. And I was the one that piped up and so everybody in the class felt some of the consequences to my disobedience at that point. I didn't really realize, though, until I became a parent that the consequences that the parent pays for the child's disobedience can be quite serious. I I didn't know that. I I thought it was just, you know, mom and dad had instituted some rules for the most part, as far as I could tell, to limit my freedom. I didn't understand that those rules were for my safety and to help me to grow up to be a decent fellow I just thought they were intended to limit my freedom. And I certainly didn't realize that when I lived in disobedience, my parents caught consequences as well. Sometimes, as I look back upon it, I can see that the consequences were things like I took the car where I wasn't supposed to take the car, I got involved in an accident, and my dad ended up paying for it. I mean, actually paid the cost to fix the car. Some of you have done those kind of things too. On occasion, you've had to bail a child out out of jail, and you paid that. Your child never thought about that as the consequence for their disobedience, but nevertheless, it was there. But even deeper than that, I I didn't realize how painful it was to a parent to have a child that lived in disobedience. I, I mean, some disobedience creates some level of pain and even more frustration and the desire I did not realize how many times my parents agonized in prayer over me. They were living into the consequences of of my disobedience. Perhaps you had never thought about that either, but nevertheless, it is there. So we should not be surprised that in this event where Adam and Eve live into disobedience, there were consequences that were felt all over the place. Not just that they did something that they weren't supposed to do, and so there was something to pay as a result of that, but the consequences that were felt in all kinds of places as a result of that. And so we take a look at those in this passage today. Now, you will not in any way understand the depth of the pain of what happened here until you can seriously grasp to some degree, to the degree that we can, until you seriously grasp the nature of God and the purposes of God. Now, we've been talking about that in those weeks while we're looking at Genesis, but the tendency for us is, you know, here's a passage, here we talk about it, we've got that, that Sunday's behind us, now we're going on, what's next? Well, These are foundational doctrines, so what's next doesn't make sense if you're not hanging on to what was before. If you, to the best that we can, because we cannot, we cannot understand the character of God in any kind of fullness. I mean, He is God, by the way. But to some degree, we can start getting some of it That you've got to hang on to. And the purposes of God, we don't know all the purposes of God, but to the degree that we can, hang on to it. These are important because this passage and the consequences will not make sense to you unless somehow you are continuing to hang on to the character and the purposes of God. So here are some of the things that we've said. We have said that God is and that God is good and that God is in relation with His own self. Now that's the hard one. God is, you just sort of take that for granted, and God is good, you believe that. That's a tremendous faith step, but nevertheless, you do believe it. But this one always is hard, always is complicated, that God is in relationship within Himself. Brother Donnie, what are you saying? Well, in the New Testament, we know that best by the word Trinity. God is in the character of who He is, has revealed to us that even though there is but one God, and we can never back up from that, not an inch, 
There is but one God, but God has shown Himself in these ways as Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Even those words are packed with all kinds of stuff that we don't have time to unpack today, but they are to at least help you to catch a bit of a glimpse that God who is one somehow is far more complex than any one that I ever thought about before. And within the very character of who God is, He lives in relationship between Father and Son and Holy Spirit. In fact, even though there's only one, He has that ongoing love relationship within Himself. Now that's a tough idea and you ought to chew on it a little bit when you get to lunch today. But it's vastly important. And so, if this is the character of God, it is His essence, it is who He is, He can be nothing else. When God creates the world, the world and all that He creates flows out of who He is. It's not like as though, you know, here's God over here, and He's, ah, oh, let's see, I'll, I'll do this, and I'll do that, and boom, and I'm, mm, that's all right. It's, to some degree, it would be kind of a bit like an artist, an artist who paints a picture or, or makes a sculpture or some kind of beautiful piece of art, it is not for the real artist just, I think I like roses, so I'll paint a rose. The picture that comes out of the artist reflects something deep within that artist. It is a reflection of, of who he or she is. That is in a very limited way what it is when God creates the world. The world reflects who He is. It is intricate. It is involved. It is the tapestry out of which it is all made. It's not apart from. It is creating out of the very essence of who God is. And so, their creation is. As God is, creation is. We are not living in the matrix. And if you don't know what that is, go watch the movie. This is not just God's imagination somehow that we're all living out. God is, creation is. God is good, creation is good. We saw that. It was good, it was good, it was good. It was very good. And as God is in relationship with Him Himself, when God created the world, He created it to be in relationship. It could be nothing else because this is who God is. This is what He makes. And we see that, of course. We've seen it as we've kind of gone through the text. But I'm somewhat reminding you and somewhat pulling all these pieces together because you've got to remember, you've got to hang on to this, or you will not understand the fall unless you can hang on to this. God didn't make us by accident or by happenstance or, oh, that's a good thought, I will make them for a relationship. He could make us no other way because that's who He is. And so we see in these creation stories relationship at every level. Here is the human who relates to the whole world around him. He was to be in a stewardship relationship to all of the world. Scientists come along and they discover these intricate webs of relationship within all of the world. Duh! Genesis 1 tells us that. He made us in such a way that we are connected and relate to all of the universe that He's made. That we are star stuff, as Carl Sagan said. But not only did He make us for relationship with the world around us, He made us for relationship with one another, of course. Within, I mean, this is, this is the natural thing, that we have families, that we have friends, that we have... This is what He made us for, but of the deepest of relationships that we have seen is that the whole created order came about for this reason, and He made this man and this woman that they would be separated from their parents and joined together, and the two would become one. And so His intent was that we would have this intense, intimate, personal relationship with another human being. And then He made us for relationship with Himself. It's not an accident. It was all He could do because this is who He was one who lived in relationship, so He made us to have the perfect, absolute, grand, without a flaw relationship with the living God, the intimacy of the Father Creator to His children that He had made. That's what He made us for. And so, even though there was a perfect relationship in all of these ways, the relationship between the humans and God was not an equal relationship. 
for God was the creator and they were the creation. And even though they shared in a love relationship that was reciprocal and unfettered, nevertheless, he was the supreme sovereign and they were the loyal subjects. And so, when the woman and her husband began to think, being tempted by the serpent, that enemy of ours, when they began to think, well, maybe God has not told us the whole story. Maybe there's something here to be desired that God is trying to keep us from. Bless their hearts, they only had one rule. There was only one place they could mess it up. Oh my goodness, if I'd only had one rule with my dad and I, you know, just one rule, that seems like that would have been pretty easy. There was only one place they could make a foul, and they sat there and they thought, hmm, you know, maybe God has deceived us. He doesn't want us to know. If we eat this thing, we will be like God. There it is, friends. There it is. There's the heart of what sin is. The heart of sin is not that you just you know, took something that wasn't yours or you hurt somebody that you shouldn't have hurt or you did some kind of evil of grand proportion. The heart of sin is that one right there. I will be like God. And so even though we don't see the words printed in the text, this is basically what their actions have said if it wasn't a thought that was in their mind. Who do you think you are to tell me I can't eat this? This is what I want to do. I will do what I want to do. I will be, without having said the word, I'm sure, but the action said, I will be my own God. And that's where we live, friends. That's where the world lives. You want to know why there's so much problem in Afghanistan? Because I will be my own God. Do you want to know why there's so much problem in any other place in the world? Because I will be my own God. And so, what seemed to be sort of a minor infraction, she just took, up, took a piece of fruit and gave it to her husband. He ate it. I had an apple this morning. Now, the fruit was probably not an apple. We don't know. The Bible doesn't say. It was some kind of fruit. It was just something they weren't supposed to eat. And she took it and she ate it and she gave it to him. And he didn't even say, what? He just said, hmm. <laughs> so he ate it too, you see. And so what seems to be a minor infraction becomes a movement of high treason against the king is exactly what it was. And so the consequences come. The consequences come after that, as they always do following disobedience. Now, there are so many questions that are raised by this text that we read a little while ago and that I, I would ask you to go home and, and read it again. It's not an easy text. There is a, a small number of words here that unfold into really huge ideas. So, so many questions that the text raised that legitimately we could stay here and deal with. We just simply don't have time. Perhaps some other time in the future we can dig down in various ways, look at it from different aspects, from different angles or something. But I, I want to look at it quickly just from sort of some of the consequences that came out of their action. What happens after the fall? The consequences. So when you read the text, you see a handful of them right off the bat. For example, the first thing that you see is the snake gets cursed. There's a curse that's upon the snake. And this snake will, from here on out, just the way that the snake moves on the ground will be a reminder of the failure of what, of what has happened here. Uh, so here's the first consequence. The snake gets cursed. Now we're going to explore that a little bit more in just a moment, but then there's another consequence right underneath that one, and that is the woman who is not cursed. You will see that the snake is cursed. The woman, there's no pronunciation of curse. There's a pronunciation of the consequence that followed her disobedience. And that consequence... Like so many things that we read in Scripture, it, 
it, it's, you know, you would think, okay, here's, here's where you broke the rule, here's the punishment that came. But you see, the stuff that becomes problem for her was stuff that was already there. Childbirth was already there. I, I don't know that she had had a child yet, but he had already said in chapter 1 to be fruitful and multiply, replenish and fill the earth. So that was not something... Childbirth didn't come about as a result of the fall. That, that was already the prediction of God. And she was already married to her husband. God had performed that ceremony. And so the problem that follows is not that these things begin. Childbirth was there. Marriage was there. But that what should have been simply a celebration of joy. They, they are even still some of the highest moments in our lives. When someone gets married and someone gets born, I, I just was in North Carolina for the birth of my ninth grandson. He's watching this morning. Hello, Canaan. It's Papa. Yeah, I know you're asleep or nursing, one of the two. There are only like three things newborns do, and I won't talk about the third one. It's <clears throat> So anyway, what should have been a point of great absolute joy became a point of pain. What an unusual thing that here is all of the animal order that seem, as far as I can tell, you know, it doesn't matter if, if you're a, a, a monkey or a dog or an elephant. You don't seem to give birth with a whole lot of turmoil. I, I was there when a couple of mine were born, and I've seen pigs born, and I've seen my babies born, and, you know, it was... The way my wife acted was quite different from the way that Sal acted. <laughs> so, did I say that right? <laughs> There's not a connection between my wife. No, I'm sorry, sweetheart, if there was any implication there, because I know she's on Facebook. So, anyway... <laughs> But, it, you know, it looks quite different. The, we call it labor. I mean, a cow gives birth and it's done. It's, and, but it's, it's labor. that something, something in the birthing of children and in the marriage is a constant reminder of the fact that, that there was a failure way back there. And part of that failure had to do with the relationship between the husband and the wife that we'll also come back to. And then for the man, interesting, there is not a curse that's placed upon the man. There's a curse on the snake. There's the challenge or the, the, the woes that come for this woman. But there is a curse in relation to what the man has done. But the curse is on the ground. The curse was not on the man. The curse was on the ground. And, and the ground which had been, to personify it, a very willing partner in the bringing forth of produce now becomes almost like an enemy. It becomes something we have to fight, we have to wrestle. Just plant a little garden sometime and see how much of the garden grows and how much the thistles grows. Well, Genesis chapter 3 tells us that's exactly the way it's going to be. It, it comes from hard work. What would have been just a blessing and a pleasure, the man would have worked hard beforehand, but it would have had a willing partner in the earth. And now not only in the earth, not just a willing partner, but the man who came from the earth is going to return to the earth. It's part of the constant reminder of what failure took place right there at the very beginning. And so there are these, there are these problems that have come, these consequences. But e even bigger, and the next step up, is the fact that the relationships that God had given to the man, all of these relationships start to crumble. The relationship with the earth, we've already seen that with the created order around him. There, there's a schism that happens between the man and, and the animals, especially this snake, even to this point. You know, some of you feel kind of comfortable around snakes, but most of us kind of say, whoa, give that guy some distance. I don't think that's just what the Scripture is talking about, that there's some kind of bad feeling about a snake or something. They're, they're just like any other creature. But there, there becomes this sort of separation between the animal order and, and the human. But there's also the separation between him. We're thinking about the relationship between the human and the world. 
And so what would have been a willing partner now becomes sort of an enemy for him. He's been separated from the relationship that he would have had naturally with the created order around him. And, and even worse than that, the relationship that he had had with his wife, that his wife had had with her husband, there's still a relationship there, but it's not that keen, intimate easy relationship that they lived in at the beginning. Now it becomes stressed and it becomes strained. It is still where we can find such godliness and such holiness. But let me tell you, the longer you're married, the more you see the results of what happened in that garden all that long time ago. The, the relationship is great and it's wonderful and it deepens and it is harder every year there's another level of how do we communicate and how do we stay in touch and how do we keep romance and all of the things that should be there see the relationship between that husband and that wife gets strained and challenged and often often broken but then the worst of all, as you would anticipate, is relationship that they were to have with God is a relationship that is cut off. They had had in the garden the most intimate of relationships. They had this perfect place where they could meet God on a daily basis, on an hour-by-hour -hour basis. And as they met God, the intimacy of the relationship, of the conversation, of the just... Could you imagine just to sit comfortably in the presence of Almighty God and enjoy that He's there. But that's cut off. That relationship is ruined. And, and part of it is outside of our text that we read today, but in the verses that follow, they were in this garden setting that was absolutely perfect for them and absolutely perfect for their communion with God, but they get cut off from that garden set, setting. They, they're excluded from it, which of all the things that it indicates shows to us that they were excluded from that intimate presence of God that they had known up to this point. Never again are they going to know what they knew when they were in the garden. They're cut off from God. Now, that is the greatest of all the tragedies that we have tried to describe here as a consequence, that they were cut off from God because God had made them. He had made them the only way God could make them for relationship with the world and with one another and with Him. That was what, listen, that was what we were made for. I don't know why. Why did God desire to have this relationship with us? It, obviously, as I've said, it sprang from His character, from who He was, but... Why would He want it? I don't know, but He made us for Him. That's what He made us for. And if we are not in that relationship, if we are not in that tight and intimate and fully open and honest and unfettered connection with God, then we are kind of like a ship that just won't float or a plane that won't fly or a fruit tree that bears no fruit or a house in which nobody can live. None of those things do what they were built to do. And when we don't live in relationship with God, we are not doing what we were built to do. No wonder, as Augustine said, when we are cut off from God, it is like a God-shaped hole that is within us that nothing else can fill. For we were made for Him. And when we're cut off from Him, we are not who we should be. And something inside of us longs for Him and is never satisfied apart from Him. For that is the substance of how we were created. We have to make one more step, y'all, in the consequences of this thing. Because it not only cut us off, the consequences struck God as well. Odd, isn't it? That what the children can do can hurt the parent? Oh yeah, you remember. 
Even now, some of you live with painful children. And so here is God who takes within Himself the consequences of what His creation has done. The Scripture hints at it here in a couple of places. First is in verse 15. For in verse 15, it talks about the serpent and the seed or the offspring. You remember that as Jim read it a little while ago. You might even have it there and look at it. You'll see that, that God says, Cursed are you to the snake, and you'll crawl on your belly, and you'll eat the dust. And then he has this very enigmatic, mysterious kind of thing. He says, And there will be enmity, enmity between you, the snake, and the woman. Enmity. They're like enemies. There's something bitterly wrong between these guys. And then he says, Her seed, that's descendants, and the snake's seed, there will be enmity. So at the beginning there is, and then you go down generations, and there still is down at the bottom. My fingers can't lie. I just can't help it. This is a sign language thing. You know, here they are, and here they are. Well, that was like, hook no, we can't even do that sign in this church, can we? It has to be that one, doesn't it? But I have no idea what I'm talking about there. But So anyway... But here's the interesting thing in verse 15 is that there's enmity between the snake and the woman and between their seed. And then it says, He, the seed, the seed of the woman will crush his... You know, it's not at that point anymore. It's that this guy gets that guy. The seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. And the serpent will inflict a pain upon his heel. The Scripture doesn't say what that means. It doesn't ex go on to explain it, but it's so odd there that here's the woman and here's, uh, excuse me, here's the snake and here's the woman and here's the woman's seed and here's the snake's seed. But when the crushing takes place, it's between the seed, this descendant of this woman that crushes the head of the serpent. There's something more than what the passage just tells. And you will not know the something more until you come to see that in Jesus, that the descendant of this woman. There is this one who is a human being, who is God, yes, who is the descendant of this woman who will crush what is represented in this serpent. Evil, Satan, devil, whatever, the evil one, it will crush him. It's hinted at there. See, God took the, the consequences into himself as a result of what this man and this woman had done. And then in verse 21, it has some more. It's almost like an innocent passage. It just throws it out there. It says, well, Adam came along and he named his wife Eve because she'd be the mother of all living. And then it says, God made some clothes for them from the skin of an animal. It's just a tiny little short passage there. And it doesn't explain very much about that, but you don't have to work very hard to see the backstory on that. If God had the skin of an animal, some animal paid with its life. There was a death that took place. There was a sacrifice that took place. And the point of the death and the sacrifice of whatever animal that was, it was to cover the shame of this man and this woman and what they had done. Far more than that they had eaten something or they had disobeyed God. The whole shame of it all is sought to be covered by the death of this animal and the skin that came from it, the sacrifice. And so it prefigures the whole sacrificial system of the Old Testament where death comes to animal after animal after animal and the shedding of blood somehow so that there can be a fixing, a mending of this broken relationship that was between God and the humans that He had made. And then it comes, of course, as we know in the New Testament story, to the ultimate sacrifice of the God Himself who took the consequences of our rebellion into Himself and became a human and lived among us. And when He died, when He died, it was to cover our shame and our rebellion and our brokenness. You didn't know it was all there in that passage, did you? Maybe you did. It is absolutely beautiful.
beautiful that today as we talk about this passage, we share this meal. For it is the symbol among followers of Christ of what He did to cover our shame. To take away the division that we brought to heal the broken relationship that we created, that God made us for and God longed for. It was all God. It was nothing that we did. It was everything that He did. As God worked through the generations and the millennia to prepare history as it flowed along for the coming of Himself in Jesus, the Son, who lived and died and rose. And just before He died, He took a common everyday meal and He put all new meaning on it. Wrapped up in the symbol of this bread and of this juice that we drink together, is this whole story from beginning to end. The bread and the juice do not heal our broken relationship with God. It is only Jesus who can do that. But it is a powerful symbol of what God has done to heal the broken relationship. And so as believers, this day, we share this meal and celebrate God's goodness that He is and that He is good and that He lives in relationship. And He has done all that is necessary to heal the broken relationship that, oh, lo, these many years humans have sustained. <laughs> he has done it in the cross. And what He asks of us is that we believe that He's done it. And that in a simple, though complex, movement of faith, we say, oh Lord God, I'm just like Adam, and I'm just like Eve. I turned from You. I wanted to be my own God. I realize I cannot do that. I confess that I tried, and I'm so sorry. I give you, Lord, although it is not much, I give you me. And oh, Lord God, from you, I receive you. That's what we mean when we talk about somebody getting saved, giving their life to Christ, being born again. And once that has become your experience, God begins to mix, to fix the consequences of the fall as He repairs our relationship with the world around us and He repairs our relationship with the people around us. He starts to make it possible for this man and this woman to live in peace and goodness and intimacy and love and to create new life. And He makes it possible in Christ that the relationship that was broken by our sin with God is healed. And so, we rightly celebrate. <laughs> I turn to Matthew chapter 26, where the Scripture says, While they were eating, Jesus took some bread... And after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples. And he said, take and eat. This is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. And so, my brothers and sisters, I'm going to pray, and after the prayer, you are invited to the table. 
Father God, we confess that like Adam and Eve of so long ago, we have turned from you and turned to ourselves. Lord God, you have done all that was needed to fix what we created. This evil that we brought, that we perpetuate upon our world and upon our families and upon our children and upon our communities. We repent of that, Lord. And we ask you in your goodness and by the power of your Holy Spirit that you take us, your children, by faith, by adoption. And you make us all that you want us to be. That we may be instruments in your hands to restore the relationships of people around us to the living God. Thank you, Lord, for this meal that we share today as it is a symbol of all that we have said, we eat it and we drink it in obedience to you. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you come and take what Christ gives freely? Tea and pride Carry not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy then was great and grace was free. Pardon then was multiplied. Jesus took some bread and after a blessing he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said take and eat this is my body and when he had taken the cup and given thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. The 
Scripture says then that Jesus gave a prediction. I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom, the prediction of the fulfillment of His kingdom. And then it says they sang a hymn and they went out to the Mount of Olives. Now we will not be going to the Mount of Olives today, but we are going to sing a hymn. This is not only a hymn that kind of wraps up this time of worship, but it is also an invitation. For we have been presented the gospel today, both in drama and in word, and by the presence of God's Holy Spirit. You are invited to respond to what the Lord may have said to you today. I, I'm not going to tell you what that was. He spoke to you. And as you heard Sunday after Sunday, every time we gather in the presence of the Lord, you are confronted with what will you do now with what God has said. Will you leave this place and be His hands and His feet in this community, hands and feet of transformation? It may be that there's someone here today who's never trusted Jesus as their personal Savior. And somehow it all became clear today. You are invited even now when we sing in just a second to come to the front and I'll talk with you and help you with that decision. Or it may be there's someone here who says, I want to be a part of a church that's going to proclaim the gospel and is going to worship the living, majestic God. We would invite you to come and be a part of this church too. Whatever the Lord may be saying to you, while we sing the nail-scarred hand, would you make that decision that God's laying on your heart even now? Let's stand. Have you failed in your plan of your storm-tossed life? Place your hand in the nails hand. Are you weary and worn from its toil and strife? Place your hand in the nails for just a moment, please. There's just a couple of things we need to do. Jim's going to bring some announcements, but two pieces I wanted you to hear from me. First is, um, we will have a very short called business meeting this Wednesday night where we deal with the report from the nominating committee, which basically has to do with our Sunday school teachers and officers. And part of that I think we might maybe already approve, but part of it we will approve on Wednesday. And that leads me to the next one. We are, um, there are several things that we are trying to do. Number one, we are working to regather as a congregation. COVID has not gone away. It, it has come back to some degree, and it's somewhat vicious. There's, we have lost loved ones, and many are ill. Um, we are watching the community and especially the church, the schools, to see what they may do. But at this point, we're, we're making short steps forward. 
We've already restarted our Wednesday night suppers. Many of you were here last Wednesday. We are projecting next Sunday to restart adult classes in the smaller classrooms unless things all fall apart this week. That's our projection. We know there won't be a huge number of people here next week. I'm not giving you permission to go to the lake instead of the sun church, you know, but you have to work that out with your family. But it is the Labor Day weekend, and we know that there will probably be a goodly number of people who are having the last fling before summer's over or what have you. Um, but we will be starting next Sunday. That will be Promotion Sunday for our children. And I'm stealing part of, your, part of what you were going to say, Jim. I'm sorry. I, I wanted them to hear parts of this from me. Um, and we will be having those adult classes in small rooms. Now, here's the second thing that we're trying to do, not only to regather after COVID or in the tailings of COVID, but we are also making a concerted effort to try to start over again reaching younger families and ministering to them and drawing them into the warmth of this fellowship. To do that is going to have to take some changes. Changes are always hard to do, but to reach younger families, we are going to be having a class that will be designed for families with younger children, basically in their 20s and 30s, and that will be Collins' class. And so, because we're trying to reach those families, we intend to make that class a, a class of younger families. And that will mean some changes for some of you. But we have set a class that after you're no longer the younger family, but the kids have gotten a little bit older, and that's probably going to be roughly in the 40s and maybe the 50s. Jim Hamilton will have a new class that will be for that group. And then we will have our other adult classes that we had before COVID. They will all be back in their places. But those two things will be a bit of a change for us. And we know there's going to be some confusion. I was out of town with the baby, and there could have been some motion that we made towards that, but there will be some confusion. I'm going to ask you from the depth of my heart, just be patient with us as we work through the steps and the changes and getting people in classrooms and so forth. And some of you will be in a different classroom than that you were in. It's not arbitrary. We are taking targeted steps towards trying to reach these younger families, and we feel like this is a step we need to take. We'll be doing some things in nursery and children that will be helping us do these things as well. So it's just part of, part of this movement that, that we are doing. So be patient with us as we try to do that. We'll probably be contacting a lot of you and making sure we get you in the right Sunday school class and that sort of thing. But that will start next Sunday. So I anticipate some confusion, but we'll work it out. But the Sunday after that will be the real push because we've got Labor Day behind us. We want to get all of us back as we can. You have seen me wearing this mask, partly because I want you to know that if you want to wear a mask, you are welcome to do so. There is no stigma in this. It is up to you and your concern for your health. Okay? So if you want to be in that Sunday school class and wear a mask, I will be in my Sunday school class and I will be wearing a mask. That's just where we are. Someday this will all be behind us, but at this point, patience and care and love is what we have to exhibit with one another as we do these things. So on the 12th will be the push to get us here and to get these things in motion again. If COVID raises its ugly head and strikes our schools real hard and they have to close down or something, we will probably do the same thing. It'll just be a short pause till we can move forward. It's not going to defeat us. It's just there, and we have to deal with it, okay? So those are the things that are coming. Just bear with us as we move through them all. We'll make some mistakes, but you will be gracious. I'm a grandfather nine times over. I need lots of patience, lots of patience. Oh, it's so sweet to see your faces. It is sweet to see your faces. Jim. Well, church, just a few things about this coming week. We want to invite you back this evening to participate uh, in the life of this church. We've got evening service at 5 p.m. 
We've got the children's and the youth. Now, um, if you're involved with the youth ministry in any way, we had a slight change of plans tonight. We were originally going to be at the Knight's house, but we have moved that to uh, the church. We're going to be in the gym from 5 to 6. And then the children are going to be in the youth room tonight. So it's mixed up tonight. We've got the children in the youth room at 5, and the youth are in the gym at 5. Evening service will be in here at the same time. On Wednesday, if you came to Wednesday Night Meal last week, there's no need for you to sign back up. Your name should already be on there for this week. If you missed the meal, uh, then you've got that QR code on your bulletin. You can either use your phone to scan that and sign up for this Wednesday night, or you can call the church office tomorrow morning, and we'll be more than happy to put you on that list. But everything, as Brother Donnie said, so far, our plan is to meet Wednesday night, and we've got youth and children's. Women's Bible study has started back up as of last week. We've got prayer meeting in the sanctuary, and that's all happening at 6 p.m. And just a reminder, it, it seems like it's been maybe 17, 18 months since we've had our regular Sunday school classes, but that is starting next Sunday. If you have a question about uh, which class you can visit, what class you might belong to, uh, please stop me or come see me in the church office next week, and be more than happy to be more than happy to place you in a class. And um, if one is, you know, you visit one next week and you'd like to kind of kind of check a few different classes out, that'd be okay too. So we want to get you guys plugged into the life of the church, and that's just one of the many ways that we're going to do it. Thank you. Would you stand? Let's sing once again. I'll cherish the old rugged cross. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross. Till my trophies have. 